the act. Is, however, this critique of Laclau really Lacanian? Yanis Stavrakakis's The Lacanian Left, an attempt to supplement Laclau's and Mouffe's project of radical democracy with Lacanian theory, disputes it. According to Stavrakakis, I started off well, but then in my work, I move continuously into more bizarre and unfathomable directions. The key reproach concerns my alleged idealization of Antigone, of the radical autonomy of her suicidal, pure desire. Such a stance excludes her from the socio-political field. I claim that the subject of an act risks an encounter with death and momentarily suspends the symbolic legal framework. But Antigone clearly does not meet these criteria. She not only risks death, she desires it. Risk entails a minimum of strategic or pragmatic calculation, which is something alien to Antigone's pure desire. Suspension presupposes a before and an after, but for Antigone there is no after. In that sense, this was never a case of an act affecting a displacement of the status quo. Her act is a one-off, and she couldn't care less about what will happen in the polis after her suicide. Really? Far from just throwing herself into the arms of death, Sophocles' Antigone insists up to her death on performing a precise symbolic gesture, the proper burial of her brother. Like Hamlet, Antigone is a drama of a failed symbolic ritual. Lacan insisted on this continuity. He analysed Hamlet in his seminar that precedes the ethics of psychoanalysis. Antigone does not stand for some extra symbolic real, but for the pure signifier. Her purity is that of a signifier. This is why, although her act is suicidal, the stakes are symbolic, and her persistence till death has a cathartic effect not only on us, the public, but also on the Theban people themselves embodied in the chorus. Stavrakakis's point here is that I elevate Antigone's radical suicidal act, which excludes her from the symbolic community into the model for a political act, thereby ignoring not only that Lacan never conceived Antigone in this way, but also the later shifts in his position. To focus exclusively on Lacan's commentary of Antigone would amount to ignoring the radical shift in Lacan's own position following the ethics seminar. Clearly, Antigone is not Lacan's last, or most insightful, word on the question of ethics and agency. His position continued to develop in a direction that undermined his earlier focus on Antigone's pure desire. Anyone taking seriously the important shift in Lacan's position has to abandon Antigone as a model of the ethico-political act, something that Zizek fails to do. Stavrakakis sees a strange regression in my work. In my early books, I insisted on the lack in the other as Lacan's key insight, while in my more recent work, I criticised this notion as belonging to deconstructionism, thus handing over to the latter Lacan's most precious insight. My notion of the act involves a miraculous emergence of unconditional positivity which suspends lack. That is, I rely on a strict opposition between lack, denoting finitude and negativity and divine miracle, denoting immortality and positivity. Assuming lack means assuming negativity and finitude, while I conceive the act as absolute positive eternal, external to the symbolic, or, as Pluth and Hohen's claim, quoted approvingly by Stavrakakis. By neglecting the importance of an act's involvement with the symbolic, Zizek seems to be saying that the real of an act happens without the symbolic. Seems is a crucial word here, and as we shall see, in Stavrakakis' book too, it registers his own doubt about the accuracy of his own reading. Such an absolutization of the act, which extracts it from its socio-symbolic texture, also makes it impossible to distinguish between true and false acts or events, between events and their simulacra, a standard argument against Badieu, as if I have not spent pages explaining how one can distinguish an event from its simulacrum by way of analysing how the event relates to the symptonal knot, the inscription of the lack in a situation. So while Stavrakakis' general line of argumentation is that I steer away from Lacan under the influence of Badieu, The ultimate joke is, predictably, that even Badieu is more Lacanian than me. What I do not see, and that Badieu does, is that the true positivity of a real event depends on its inextricable relation to the void of the evental sight, to a registering of negativity. 
No wonder that I criticize Badieu when he warns of the totalitarian danger of enforcing a truth on a situation, of ignoring the nameless, the excess of the multiplicity of reality, which resists being subsumed under a truth procedure. This is what Stalinism did in imposing forced collectivization and a centralized planned economy. It enacted its voluntarism, which ignored the inertia of reality, and in a quite consistent way, since Stalinism did not admit this excess of the nameless, it had to interpret the resistance of reality to its projects as intentional counter-revolution. And as expected, for Stavrakakis, this also holds for my notion of the act as unconditional. Insofar as it knows no limitation, for which Badiou allows when he warned against the excess of enforcement, it necessarily leads to a totalitarian assertion. The reason I find Badiou problematic here is that, for me, something is wrong with the very notion that one can excessively enforce a truth. One is almost tempted to apply here the logic of the joke quoted by Lacan. My fiancée is never late for an appointment, because the moment she is late, she is no longer my fiancée. A truth is never enforced, because the moment the fidelity to truth functions as an excessive enforcement, we are no longer dealing with a truth, with fidelity to a truth event. In the case of Stalinism, its problem was not simply that of enforcing the truth, ruthlessly imposing it onto the situation. The problem is rather that the truth which was enforced, the vision of a centralized planned economy and so forth, was in itself not a truth, so that the resistance of reality against it was a sign of its own falsity. The story goes on in a predictable way. My notion of a momentary miraculous act implies an act without after. That is, I ignore the effects of the act, its inscription into the situation, as if I have not written many pages developing how what matters is not the act itself, but the day after, the way an act rearticulates the situation. Furthermore, I am accused of privileging positivity, of obliterating negativity, but such an act without after, just a rupture, a cut, would have been precisely a pure, non-positivized negativity. So I ignore the positivization, institutionalization of lack. Zizek seems, seek, to deny the very possibility of institutionalizing lack and division, of articulating a positive political order encircling but not neutralizing negativity and impossibility. As if the whole point of my reading of Hegel's political thought is not that the Hegelian state is a negativity institutionalized as if my privileging of the Lenin of 1919-22 to 22 over the Lenin of 1917 is not precisely the privileging of the Lenin of the institutionalization of a new order which positivizes revolutionary negativity. Furthermore, because I ignore negativity, I do not see how the negative gesture of creating empty space is a condition of a positive act. Paul Klee once said, speaking of Mondrian, to create emptiness is the principal act. And this is true creation, because this emptiness is positive. In politics, this is the radical democratic strategy, and this is what Zizek seems, seek, unable to understand. As if I have not written pages and pages on opening up empty space, on reaching the point at which rien n'aura au lieu que le lieu, say, apropos of the relation between the death drive and sublimation, the negativity of the death drive as the condition of positive sublimation, how then does Stavrakakis react to the massive evidence that I have amply developed all the points he reproaches me for ignoring? Lack in the other, negativity, symbolic determination of the act. Instead of questioning his own reading of my notion of the act, he proclaims me a pervert, in theory. I have no intention to teach Zizek Lacanian commonplaces. I take it for granted that he knows them very well, better than I do. But this is exactly why it causes me great concern when Zizek himself seems to forget or abandon them. It is not by coincidence that I have used the psychoanalytic term disavowal to describe this attitude. As is well known, disavowal, as the fundamental operation of perversion, involves the simultaneous recognition and denial of something, in the clinic of castration. In fact, Zizek's response seems, seek, to come under this description. The sleight of hand is here truly breathtaking. Every counter-argument of mine is in advance devalued. I am accused of claiming A, 
I cite proof that I am not claiming A, and the answer is that I merely disavow my sticking to A, that my reasoning is, I know very well that A does not hold, but nonetheless I continue to act as if A holds. So when, at the end of the chapter dedicated to my work, Stavrakakis writes, why does Zizek bypass the whole Lacanian theorization of another, feminine, jouissance? There is no point defending myself by referring to dozens of pages in which I deal precisely with jouissance féminine. Such defense would be in advance devalued as a perverse recital of absurdity. The only pervert here is Stavrakakis himself. What if his underlying logic is, I know very well that my reproaches to Zizek are meaningless, but I continue to stick to them. What if, however, Stavrakakis is simply right in his claims about my notion of the act? On what evidence are these claims based? Here is a passage in which he allegedly demonstrates how my work displays the mechanism of disavowal in its unmistakable purity. Consider the following two quotations. First, Zizek argues that, in a situation like today's, the only way really to remain open to a revolutionary opportunity is to renounce facile calls to direct action. The only way to lay the foundations for a true radical change is to withdraw from the compulsion to act, to do nothing, thus opening up the space for a different kind of activity. Three pages later, he condemns the resistance to political acts and the obsession with radical evil. It is as if the supreme good today is that nothing should happen. What is one supposed to conclude from this? Surely to do nothing does not make sense as a remedy against those who supposedly argue that nothing should happen. What one really concludes from this passage is that it exemplifies misreading in its unmistakable purity. The appearance of contradiction vanishes the moment we take into account the rather obvious fact that I am systematically opposing true activity, fidelity to the act proper, and false activity, which merely reproduces the existing constellation. Plus ça change, plus ça reste le même. We are active all the time to make sure that nothing will change. The condition for true change, a true act, is to stop false activity, or, as Badieu puts it in a sentence I quote repeatedly, it is better to do nothing than to contribute to the invention of formal ways of rendering visible that which empire already recognizes as existent. Another case. After quoting passages in which I assert contingency, every act is embedded in a contingent historical situation, and passages in which I assert the unconditional character of the act, Stavrakakis asks, how can an awareness of contingency be a necessary condition for something which actually presupposes that we abandon it and is located beyond any conditionality? The unconditional revolutionary act? Unfortunately for me, as a Hegelian, there is no contradiction here. What I refer to as the unconditional act is not the nonsense imputed to me, an act outside history, outside the symbolic, but simply the act irreducible to its conditions. Such an act is not only rooted in its contingent conditions, these very conditions make it into an act. The same gesture, performed at a wrong moment, too early or too late, is no longer an act. The properly dialectical paradox here is that what makes an act unconditional is its very contingency. If the act were necessary, this would mean that it is fully determined by its conditions, that it can be deduced from them, as the optimal version arrived at through strategic reasoning or rational choice theory. There is no need even to mention Hegel here. Derrida and Leclau suffice. In his reading of Kierkegaard, Derrida spoke about the madness of the act of choice decision. The link between the situation and the act is thus clear. Far from being determined by the situation, or from intervening in it from a mysterious outside, acts are possible on account of the ontological non-closure, inconsistency, gaps in a situation. Further proof of my practice of fetishistic disavowal is the alleged perverse paradox of my rejection of utopias while nonetheless claiming that today it is more important than ever to hold this utopian place of the global alternative open, as if I have not repeatedly elaborated different meanings of utopia. Utopia as simple imaginary impossibility, the utopia of a perfected harmonious social order without antagonisms, the consumerist utopia of contemporary capitalism, and utopia in the more radical sense of enacting what, within the framework of the existing social relations, 
appears as impossible, this second utopia is atopic, only with regard to these relations. And so on. All Stavrakakis's proofs rely on such misreadings. Commenting on my claim that, in Lacan's later versions of the act, this moment of madness beyond strategic intervention remains, he writes, is this idea of the supposedly unconditional real act, of an act unbound by any relation to the symbolic field, what defines Lacan's notion of the act? Note the breathtakingly false paraphrase from the claim that all authentic acts contain a moment of madness beyond strategic intervention, a claim found also in Derrida or Laclau, he jumps to an act bounded by any relation to the symbolic field. With such paraphrases, anything can be proven. Since Stavrakakis also accuses me of totally ignoring the history of Marxism, let me recall Karl Kautsky's defense of multi-party democracy. Kautsky conceived the victory of socialism as the parliamentary victory of the Social Democratic Party, and even suggested that the appropriate political form of the passage from capitalism to socialism would be the parliamentary coalition of progressive bourgeois parties and socialist parties. One is tempted to push this logic to the brink and suggest that, for Kautsky, the only acceptable revolution would be one that took place after a referendum, in which at least 51% of voters approved it. In his writings of 1917, Lenin saved his utmost acerbic irony for those who engage in the endless search for some kind of guarantee for the revolution. This guarantee assumes two main forms, either the reified notion of social necessity, one should not risk the revolution too early, one has to wait for the right moment, when the situation is mature with regard to the laws of historical development. It is too early for the socialist revolution, the working class is not yet mature, or normative, democratic, legitimacy. The majority of the population is not on our side, so the revolution would not really be democratic. As Lenin repeatedly puts it, in other words, it is as if, before the revolutionary agent risks the seizure of state power, it should get permission from some figure of the big other, organize a referendum which will ascertain that the majority supports the revolution. With Lenin, as with Lacan, the point is that a revolution ne s'autorise que d'elle-même. One should accept the revolutionary act not covered by the big other. The fear of taking power prematurely, the search for the guarantee, is the fear of the abyss of the act. Democracy is thus not only the institutionalization of the lack in the other. Incidentally, the whole point of Hegel's theory of constitutional monarchy is that it is also exactly the same. By institutionalizing the lack, it neutralizes, normalizes it, so that the inexistence of the big other, Lacan's Il n'y a pas de grand autre, is again suspended. The big other is again here in the guise of the democratic legitimization, authorization of our acts. In a democracy, my acts are covered as legitimate acts which carry out the will of the majority. In contrast to this logic, the role of emancipatory forces is not to passively reflect the opinion of the majority, but to instigate the working classes to mobilize their forces, and thus to create a new majority. Or, as Trotsky put it in Terrorism and Communism, if the parliamentary regime, even in the period of peaceful, stable development, was a rather crude method of discovering the opinion of the country, and in the epoch of revolutionary storm completely lost its capacity to follow the course of the struggle and the development of revolutionary consciousness, the Soviet regime, which is more closely, straightly, honestly bound up with the toiling majority of the people, does achieve meaning, not in statically reflecting a majority, but in dynamically creating it. This last point relies on a crucial philosophical premise which renders deeply problematic the standard dialectical materialist theory of knowledge as reflection, propagated by Lenin himself in his materialism and imperial criticism. Kautsky's worry that the Russian working class took power too early implies the positivist vision of history as an objective process which determines in advance the possible coordinates of political interventions. Within this horizon, it is unimaginable that a radical political intervention would change these very objective coordinates and thus, in a way, create the conditions for its own success. An act proper is not just a strategic intervention into a situation bound by its conditions. It retroactively creates its own conditions, 
recall Borges's precise formulation of the relationship between Kafka and the multitude of his precursors from ancient Chinese authors to Robert Browning. Kafka's idiosyncrasy, in greater or less degree, is present in each of these writings. But if Kafka had not written, we would not perceive it, that is to say, it would not exist. Each writer creates his precursors. His work modifies our conception of the past, as it will modify the future. The properly dialectical solution of the dilemma of is it really there in the source, or did we only read it into the source, is thus, it is there, but we can only perceive and state this retroactively from today's perspective. This retroactivity was articulated by Deleuze when Deleuze talks about genesis, of the actual out of the virtual. He does not mean temporal evolutionary genesis, the process of the spatio-temporal becoming of a thing, but a genesis without dynamism, evolving necessarily in the element of a superhistoricity, a static genesis. This static character of the virtual field finds its most radical expression in Deleuze's notion of a pure past, a virtual past which already contains things still present. A present can become past because, in a way, it is already. It can perceive itself as part of the past. What we are doing now is, will have become, history. It is with respect to the pure element of the past, understood as the past in general, as an a priori past, that a given former present is reproducible, and the present present is able to reflect itself. Does this mean that this pure past involves a thoroughly deterministic notion of the universe in which everything to happen, to come, all actual spatio-temporal deployment, is already part of an immemorial atemporal virtual network? No, and for a very precise reason because the pure past must be amenable to change through the occurrence of any new present. It was none other than T.S. Eliot who first clearly formulated the link between our dependence on tradition and our power to change the past. Tradition cannot be inherited, and if you want it, you must obtain it by great labour. It involves, in the first place, the historical sense, which we may call nearly indispensable to anyone who would continue to be a poet beyond his 25th year. And the historical sense involves a perception, not only of the pastness of the past, but of its presence. The historical sense compels a man to write, not merely with his own generation in his bones, but with a feeling that the whole of the literature of Europe from Homer, and within it the whole of the literature of his own country, has a simultaneous existence and composes a simultaneous order. What happens when a new work of art is created is something that happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it. The existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves, which is modified by the introduction of the new, the really new, work of art among them. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives. For order to persist after the supervention of novelty, the whole existing order must be, if ever so slightly, altered. And so the relations, proportions, values of each work of art toward the whole are readjusted, and this is conformity between the old and the new. Whoever has approved this idea of order, of the form of European, of English literature, will not find it preposterous that the past should be altered by the present, as much as the present is directed by the past. When Eliot writes that, when judging a living poet, you must set him among the dead, he provides a precise example of Deleuze's pure past. When he writes that the existing order is complete before the new work arrives, for order to persist after the supervention of novelty, the whole existing order must be, if ever so slightly, altered. He no less clearly formulates the paradoxical link between the completeness of the past and our capacity to change it retroactively. Precisely because the pure past is complete, each new work rearranges its entire balance. Recall Borges's idea of how Kafka created his predecessors. Such retroactive causality, exerted by the effect itself upon its causes, is the minimal sine qua non of freedom. This is where Peter Hallwood falls short in his otherwise excellent Out of This World, where he stresses only the aspect of the pure past as the virtual field in which the fate of all actual events is sealed in advance, since everything is already written in it. At this point, 
where we view reality subspecie aeternitatis, absolute freedom coincides with absolute necessity and its pure automatism. To be free means to let oneself freely flow in with the substantial necessity. But while Hallward is right to emphasize that, for Deleuze, freedom isn't a matter of human liberty, but of liberation from humanity, of fully submerging oneself in the creative flux of the absolute life, his political conclusion from this seems too facile. Since a free mode or monad is simply one that has eliminated its resistance to the sovereign will that works through it, so then it follows that the more absolute the sovereign's power, the more free are those subject to it. Hallwood ignores the retroactive movement on which Deleuze also insists the way this eternal pure past which fully determines us is itself subjected to retroactive change. We are thus simultaneously less free and more free than we think. We are thoroughly passive, determined by and dependent on the past, but we have the freedom to define the scope of this determination, that is, to overdetermine the past which will determine us. Deleuze is here unexpectedly close to Kant, for whom I am determined by causes, but I can retroactively determine which causes will determine me. We, subjects, are passively affected by pathological objects and motivations, but, in a reflexive way, we ourselves have the minimal power to accept or reject being affected in this way. In other words, we retroactively determine the causes allowed to determine us, or at least the mode of this linear determination. Freedom is thus inherently retroactive. At its most elementary, it is not a free act which, out of nowhere, starts a new causal link, but a retroactive act of endorsing which link sequence of necessities will determine me. Here, one should add a Hegelian twist to Spinoza. Freedom is not simply recognized, known necessity, but recognized, assumed necessity, the necessity constituted, actualized, through this recognition. So, when Deleuze refers to Proust's description of Vantier's music that haunts Swan, as if the performers not so much played the little phrase as executed the rites necessary for it to appear, he is evoking the necessary illusion, generating the sense event is experienced as a ritualistic evocation of a pre-existing event, as if the event was already there, waiting for our call in its virtual presence. What directly resonates in this topic is, of course, the Protestant trope of predestination. Far from being a reactionary theological trope, predestination is a key element of the materialist theory of sense, on condition that we read it along the lines of the Deleuzean opposition between the virtual and the actual. That is to say, predestination does not mean that our fate is sealed in an actual text, existing for eternity in the divine mind. The texture which predestines us belongs to the purely virtual eternal past, which, as such, can be retroactively rewritten by our act. This, perhaps, is the ultimate meaning of the singularity of Christ's incarnation. It is an act which radically changes our destiny. Prior to Christ, we were determined by fate, caught in the cycle of sin and its payment, while Christ's erasure of our past sins means precisely that his sacrifice changes our virtual past and thus sets us free. When Deleuze writes that my wound existed before me, I was born to embody it, does this variation on the theme of the Cheshire cat and its smile from Alice in Wonderland, the cat was born to embody its smile, not provide a perfect formula of Christ's sacrifice, Christ was born to embody his wound, to be crucified. The problem is the literal teleological reading of this proposition, as if the actual deeds of a person merely actualize its atemporal, eternal fate, inscribed in its virtual idea. Caesar's only real task is to become worthy of the events he has been created to embody, amor fati. What Caesar actually does adds nothing to what he virtually is, when Caesar actually crosses the Rubicon, this involves no deliberation or choice, since it is simply part of the entire immediate expression of Caesarness. It simply unrolls or unfolds something that was encompassed for all times in the notion of Caesar. However, what about the retroactivity of a gesture which reconstitutes this past itself? This, perhaps, is the most succinct definition of what an authentic act is, in our ordinary activity, we
we effectively just follow the virtual phantasmatic coordinates of our identity, while an act proper is the paradox of an actual move which, retroactively, changes the very virtual, transcendental coordinates of its agent's being. Or, in Freudian terms, which not only changes the actuality of our world, but also rouses its infernal regions. We have thus a kind of reflexive folding back of the condition onto the given it was the condition for, while the pure past is the transcendental condition for our acts. Our acts not only create an actual new reality, they also retroactively change this very condition. In predestination, fate is substantialized into a decision that precedes the process, so that the stake of individuals' activities is not to performatively constitute their fate, but to discover or guess one's pre-existing fate. What is thereby obfuscated in the dialectical reversal of contingency into necessity, or the way the outcome of a contingent process is the appearance of necessity, things retroactively will have been necessary. This reversal was described by Jean-Pierre Dupuis. The catastrophic event is inscribed into the future as a destiny, for sure, but also as a contingent accident. It could not have taken place, even if, in futur intérieur, it appears as necessary. If an outstanding event takes place, a catastrophe, for example, it could not not have taken place. Nonetheless, insofar as it did not take place, it is not inevitable. It is thus the event's actualization, the fact that it takes place, which retroactively creates its necessity. Dupuis takes as an example the French presidential elections in May 1995. Here is the January forecast of the main polling institute. If, on next May 8th, Mr. Balladur is elected, one can say that the presidential election was decided before it even took place. If, accidentally, an event takes place, it creates the preceding chain, which makes it appear inevitable. This, not the commonplaces regarding how the underlying necessity expresses itself in and through the accidental play of appearances, is, in Nuce, the Hegelian dialectic of contingency and necessity. The same goes for the October Revolution. Once the Bolsheviks won and stabilized their hold on power, their victory appeared as an outcome and expression of a deeper historical necessity, and even of Bush's much-contested first U.S. presidential victory. After the contingent and contested Florida majority, his victory retroactively appears as an expression of a deeper U.S. political trend. In this sense, although we are determined by destiny, we are nonetheless free to choose our destiny. This, according to Dupuis, is also how we should approach the ecological crisis, not to realistically appraise the possibilities of the catastrophe, but to accept it as destiny in the precise Hegelian sense. Like the election of Balladur, if the catastrophe happens, one can say that its occurrence was decided before it even took place. Destiny and free action, blocking the if, thus go hand in hand. Freedom is, at its most radical, the freedom to change one's destiny.